Um, thank you for having me. It's exciting to be here. Uh, I think that this is a really cool idea, this trimester program um, for uh, harmonic analysts and analytic number theorists. Um, and um, and uh, you know, it's been very difficult in many ways with the coronavirus, but I've, I've gotten to visit and talk with a, a lot more people. Um, it's hard for me to travel that much because I have two little kids at home. Um, so anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here with you. Um, so at this, at talking at the start of this program, I thought it would be fun and interesting to give a talk about open problems and, and thing, instead of things that we know about things that we don't know and that, I'm, that, I, that I've been wondering about recently. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Um, you know, it could be that some of these problems, people are similar to things that, that some of you have thought about, that people have thought about before. Um, uh, it's sometimes a little hard to know because we don't spend as much time sharing uh, uh, problems, things that we're stuck on as, as things that we've proven. Um, anyway, um, so, well, okay. So these are some questions that have been on my mind. So these questions come from harmonic analysis, but some of them, seem to be related to number theory. It seems like perhaps there's some number theory structure in the background of it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start with decoupling for the parabola. They come from trying to understand examples about decoupling for the parabola. Well, actually, I, another thing I wanna say at the beginning is I, that, that I very much hope the talk is understandable to everybody. Um, so I'll pause from time to time and put any time put questions into the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on it. Um, and I wanted at the beginning to say decoupling a little bit slowly to make sure that, that for that, for the people who are not harmonic analysts, that, that, that it's clear. Okay, so let P be the unit, the truncated parabola and cover a little neighborhood of P with N rectangular tiles called theta, dimensions N to the minus two by N to the minus one. So this is the parabola, then the tiles look like that. So um, now suppose that for each tile, there's a function f theta whose Fourier transform is supported in that tile. And then let f be the sum of all these functions. So the Fourier transform of f is supported in this little neighborhood of the parabola. And um, the brigand demeter decoupling theorem says that under these hypotheses, the L6 norm of f is bounded basically by the sum of the L6 norms of the f theta squared to the one half up to this small point. Okay, um, now what I actually wanna talk about is a corollary or a special case of this. Um, it's a special case that's often applied, for example, to bound exponential sums. So suppose that F and F theta are as above, um, and suppose that F theta L infinity is at most one for each theta. For example, F theta could be a single complex exponential, um, like A theta e to the two pi i omega theta x, so here's theta and then omega theta is some frequency in there, and a theta is at most one. So for example, f theta could be like that. Um, then the conclusion is that the L6 norm of f on the ball of radius n squared is bounded up to a little bit, so I'll write it that way, by um, number of terms to the one half times the L6 norm of each term, which works out to be n to the seven sixths. Um, so for a little perspective, there are n um, different thetas. So at each point x, f is a sum of n terms, and they each have norm at most one by hypothesis. So by the triangle inequality, the norm of f is at most n. And if, if they each have size, each term has size one, and if we had square root cancellation, then f theta would have size n to the one half, just as sort of mild posts to keep in mind. Um, so from that L6 bound, we get a bound for super level sets. So let U lambda be the points in R2 where the norm of F is bigger than lambda. And then a corollary for, if you take that L6 norm and just translate it into a bound for these super level sets, it says that if F and F theta are as above and F theta L infinity is at most one for each theta, then the size of this level set in the ball of radius N squared is bounded by 
um, n to the seven lambda to the minus six. And just to get us to plug in a couple numbers to get a sense of what this means, if we plug in that lambda is n or almost n, then a bound for this is n. Uh, and if we plug in that lambda is root n, then uh, what we get here is n to the fourth, which is the area of the whole bn squared. And that makes sense because we, we expect examples where there's square root cancellation on the whole ball. So this, 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 could, this could be the whole ball. Okay. Um, let me pause and make sure that this setup is clear so far because it's what we'll build on for the whole talk. So if you, if you have, there, have any questions or things I could clarify, put them in the chat. Okay. Um, so, so our main question is, for this bound, what are all of the sharp examples that we know? That's my, my starting question. And the situation depends a lot on the value of lambda. So first I'll talk about the biggest lambda. So the biggest that lambda could be by the triangle inequality is n, say n over 10, so if this bound. And in this case, there are many examples where this is big. And the set un over 10 doesn't need to have any special structure um, for this to happen. Um, so these examples are based on wave packets, um, which I'll also explain a little slowly for the, for the number thirsts. So remember, theta is a, is a small rectangle with these dimensions. And then it has a dual rectangle, theta star, n squared by n. And we can tile the plane by translates of this dual rectangle. So if this is theta, then the dual rectangle looks like that. And then we can tile the plane by translates of that rectangle. So the tile, a little piece of the tiling looks like so. Okay, so t, t sub theta is this tiling, a set of tiles. And for each tile in this tiling, say over here, there is a wave packet, Wt, uh, with the following properties. Its Fourier transform is supported in theta. It has norm approximately one on t. And it's not supported on t, but it's rapidly decaying away from t. OK, so now um, we can choose our f theta by a linear combination of these wave packets. And that'll be Fourier supported in theta, because they each are. And basically, this sum, um, because the wt are rapidly decaying away from t, basically it's just equal to at wt on each t separate. Okay, and so as long as these coefficients are bounded by one tenth for safety, then when you add up all of this uh, because of the rapid decay, the L infinity norm is at most one. So that's a class of examples now that we can play with um, to try to make the the to make the u lambda large. Okay, so to, so to make u lambda large, we can do wave packet tuning. And actually we can take a set of n random unit balls in Bn squared or any balls that are fairly well spaced. Um, and we can make f big on, on those balls. So if this is, that's our Bn squared, um, then inside of it, we have n random unit balls. So that looks like this. Um, and then if we look at our wave packets, if we pick, fix a particular direction, then the tiles in the tiling might look like so. And I guess I didn't draw my scaling that well, but the, if you have the, the number of tiles going across here is n, and there are n random balls. And so a typical one of these balls will, a typical one of these rectangles will contain on the order of one ball. Is there, just because there are n balls and there are n rectangles. And um, that's true in each direction, and there are n directions. So each unit ball lies in around n rectangles of t. Um, maybe I'll draw the rectangles in one other direction. Try to do this without making the picture too confusing. So those are the rectangular tiles for a different theta. Okay, so now we're gonna try to rig the frequencies that, that rig the coefficients a sub t to make this function really big on each of the red dots. So for each rectangular tile t, I only have one coefficient a sub t to play with. 
Um, so I can only really pick one, if I, well, if I am not very clever, I can only pick one red dot and I can try to arrange my coefficient to help the function be big at that one red dot. So what we'll do is for each red dot, each J, I'll choose a collection of tubes going through that dot. Um, so each of the, each T and TJ contains XJ. So XJ are some of the tubes that go through. If, if, uh, if this here is the dot XJ, then TJ are some of the tubes that go through this dot. But the sets TJ are disjoint from each other. But I can still arrange that each TJ has about N um, uh, rectangles in it. That's because each rectangle only basically was going through one ball anyway. OK, so now for each T and TJ, I'm going to choose the coefficient a sub t to try to make my function big at the point xj. Um, and the way I'll do that is a sub t has norm one. So basically, I just get to choose the phase. And I'm going to choose the phase to make it positive real. And then when I evaluate f of xj, I add up all of these different wt's, all the different thetas. Um, and since they're all positive real, the size of f of xj is at least the size of tj, which is around n. This is slightly heuristic because there are also there are also other other wave packets going through xj that weren't in tj, um, and conceivably they could screw things up. But it's very unlikely that they would screw things up in an organized way. Um, so this isn't a full this is a sketch of a proof and not a full proof. But um, but this but I'm, it's true. Okay. Um, so when we do that. Um, since each tj has around n tubes in it, then f of x will be around, will be bigger than say n over 10 on the set u. And u is n random unit balls, so, um, so the, the volume of the set is bigger than u. Okay. Let me take a pause there to see if there are any questions or comments in the chat. So let's just summarize. So for the biggest lambda, um, we have this bound. And um, there are many sharp examples for this bound. In fact, the set where f is as big as n over 10 could be a random set of n unit balls. OK, let's quickly do the other extreme. The smallest that lambda could be is the square root of n. And in that case, our bound is the trivial bound that the the size where it's bigger than root n in bn squared is at most the whole ball. So this is obviously true. And there are many sharp examples. So if we take a sum of wave packets with random signs, then we'll get square root cancellation almost everywhere. So the size of s will be around, size of f will be around n to the half for most of the x. So, right, so there are even more, just tons and tons of examples. OK, now the part that is the most interesting for me that I don't understand very well is the intermediate lambda. So suppose that lambda is much bigger than n to the 1 half and much smaller than n. And in this talk, I'm going to use this symbol um, to mean much less than, uh, hopefully not offending the analytic number theorists. OK, so in this medium range, I know very few sharp examples, very few examples where this bound is sharp. Um, so first of all, wave packet tuning does not work particularly well for intermediate lambda. Here's how it works. Here's how it turns out. Um, if, if you have a set of n squared lambda inverse random unit balls in bn squared, then you can do that wave packet tuning and you can get an example where u lambda contains most of these balls. But this n squared lambda inverse is much smaller than the actual upper bound n to the seventh lambda to the minus six for u lambda. So wave packet tuning doesn't give any sharp examples except when lambda is n, very close to n. Okay, but there are sharp examples. And this is the key example. It's an exponential sum that is, um, appears a lot in analytic number theory, for example, in the circle method and, and in connection with Waring's problem. Um, so it's the sum j equals 1 to n of e of, so for this e of x is e to the 2 pi i x, um, j over n x1 plus j squared over n squared x2. And there are n terms in this sum, and the frequencies are evenly spaced along the parabola. And so if we, um, if we cover the parabola with little rectangles, there's one per rectangle, a one per theta as before, so we have this. Okay, and for this function f, it's actually true 
that the upper bound is um, sharp up to that the, 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 the u lambda intersect bn squared really is as big as this bound for all of the lambdas. And um, let's describe briefly the set u lambda where it's big. OK, so the key observation is that if p1 and p2 and q are integers, then when you evaluate f at p1 over qn and p2 over qn squared, you just plug these in here, the n and the n squared cancel those, and you get this sum. And the point is that this sum is periodic with period q. If you increase j by q, then it increases this whole thing by an integer, so it doesn't change the value. Um, so it's periodic with period q, and the sum from each period has size around root q. And that's non, it's provable using um, Gauss sums, I guess, and it's in, intuitively very plausible that it should have square root cancellation. OK, so, the, um, so if you take the norm of this thing, there are about n over q periods, and each period uh, has the size q to the 1 half, and then they're, they're all the same. So the norm of this thing is about n over q times q to the half. And those are, those are the points where this key example is big. OK, so now if we let uq be the one neighborhood of the rectangular lattice here, these are all of the points. So in, these were the points um, p1 over qn comma p2 over qn squared. Those, those points were all in this lattice. And you can take the one neighborhood of it because this exponential sum doesn't change very much if you move x by order of one. Um, so at all those points, f of x is bigger than n times q to the half. So there's a lattice of points where it's big. And, and actually, there's a lattice for each q. So then if you take all of the q of an appropriate size and put them together, u lambda contains that. And that's big enough to match the upper bound from decoupling. So this key example is big on an interesting set, u lambda. u lambda has a special structure. It's organized into a fairly small number of lattices, small neighborhoods of lattices. Um, OK. So uh, un until recently, the key example was the only sharp example that I knew for this problem. Um, and recently, I had an idea for a variation, small variation on this key example. And it uses algebraic integers instead of just regular integers. And actually, I don't have a full proof yet, but I have some heuristics that suggest that it will give a sharp example. You know, it might be already known in the number theory community. I'll write down this function in a second. It's the function that comes up if you were to try to do um, the circle method or Waring's problem using a ring of algebraic integers instead of using the regular integers. Okay, so I picked a concrete ring of algebraic integers, uh, which is easier for me as a harmonic analyst. Um, so, so we look at numbers of the form n1 plus n2 square root of 2, where the ni are integers, and their size goes up to square root of n. And this square root of n is dictated by saying the normalization is that the number of this, the cardinality of an is around n. And these numbers have size about root n. So then f of x is this exponential sum, and we normalize it by dividing by root n. It looks just like the exponential sum, the key example, except that instead of integers j, we have these algebraic integers a. OK. Now, these frequencies are actually also evenly spaced over the parabola. It's not as immediately obvious like it was when, when they were integers. But because the square root number square root 2 is hard to approximate by rationals, this number square root 2 here, the elements of a n are pretty evenly spaced. And therefore, when we break this function into f thetas, each f theta is just one complex exponential, just like in the key example. OK. Um, so I conjecture that for this function, u lambda matches the upper bound from decoupling. And on the next few slides, I'll give some heuristics supporting this conjecture. OK, so because it's not, because I, I was talking about things that are new and haven't, that are, haven't been written in a paper, um, I put a lot of details on these slides. Um, I'll post the slides later in case people want to look at them. Um, but we, OK, we may not do every detail. Um, OK, so the idea is similar to before. Um, we can write these algebraic integers. So if we pick some q, which plays the role of q before, say in a sub m, um, 
then we can write our A as B times Q plus a remainder, where B would be in AN over M. And the remainder would lie roughly in AM. The number of choices for this remainder is just the cardinality of the quotient group Z adjoint root two modulo Q times Z adjoint root two. So when we do this whole sum, we could sum over the remainder first, and then we could sum over the B. Um, and, um, okay. So we sum over the remainder first and inside we sum over the B and we're gonna look for that UQ where each of these blue sums is really big, uh, which matches what happened for the key example. Okay, um, so if we want this inner sum, if we look at this inner sum, the inner sum is over B. Um, and so the inner sum is over B, but there are some pieces of it that don't depend on B that only depend on R. And so we're gonna take those pieces and move them to the outside. So this is the part, this E of R over N to the half and so on. That's the part that only depended on R. And inside there's a part that only depended on B. We want to define the set U sub Q so that uh, each of those blue functions there is a, is a set of X's so that each of those blue things is almost one. Say it's one plus something small. And then when we add them all up, there won't be any cancellation. So when we do that, um, each of these inner sums will have size around N over M, the number of terms in the sum. And then heuristically, we could expect that the whole sum is a, it's a sum of R things of each of size N over M. And there's probably some cancellation among those R things. So if there were square root cancellation, heuristically, we would expect the whole sum would have size R to the, the number of R's to the one half times N over M. Uh, so that would work out to n times m to the minus a half. And that matches the, 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 the key example where we, you know, with, when the denominator was q, it was n over the size of q to the one half. Okay, so what needs to happen for this blue thing to be almost one for all of the b's? Okay, so the, the place where we benefit from these being algebraic integers is that they're closed under products. So an is n, n1 plus n2 root two. And if I multiply together two numbers like that, where the ni are integers, I get a new number like that. So a, a n1 times a n2 is about con approximately contained in a of n1 times n2. Okay, so that's helpful because it means that that this messy thing over here is in a n squared over m uh, because the, the b is in a n over m and the q is in a m. So by this product rule, this thing is in here. So this blue expression has the following form. It's um, this b we can expand. It's b1 q plus b2 root two q. And this thing we can expand out in a similar way. And those, those things are all integers and they're not too big. So we're just gonna try to look for a set where any, anything like that is very close to one. Okay. So we wanted to find our set UQ so that any exponential of this form is close to one whenever the BIs and CIs are integers and they're not too big in an appropriate way. Okay. So now UQ is, here's the actual definition. It's the set of points where, first of all, E of Q over N to the half X1 is very close to one. And here's what very close means. And the motivation for that is that if you look at this first bit, E of B1 Q over N to the half X1, that will be this number to the B1. And B1 is not so big. And this is just tuned so that even after we raise this thing to the B1, it's still close to one. And then each of these other criterion is analogous to that, but it matches one of the other terms that appears in this, in the sum inside of the E. So UQ is the set of X where various things are very close to one. Okay. So this definition is quite similar to the definition of a Bohr set. And um, 
and the way people analyze Bohr sets, I think it should also work. Heuristically, the definition, the density of this set is the following. So what's the, if you pick X1 randomly, what's the probability that this will be true? It's this. So it's about M to the half over N to the half. And then each one of these has a certain probability of happening. And uh, heuristically, those are independent of each other. So the density of the set UQ is multiply them all together. Um, and then if you look at how much of UQ, what's the volume of UQ in the ball of radius n squared, you can approximate it using the density and you get that. And I think all of that can be made rigorous using the way people analyze Bohr sets. Okay. Um, so um, this U sub Q is also quite a special set. It's not a lattice like in the key example, it's more like a Bohr set, but it's approximately the one neighborhood of a generalized arithmetic progression. So maybe I'll remember, remind people what that is. Generalized arithmetic progression is um, A plus some J equals one to D of NJ times um, delta J, where the NJ are integers from one up to some capital NJ. So this is a generalized arithmetic progression and sets of this form um, are pretty close to sets of this. Okay. So for each Q, our algebraic integer example, I conjecture is big on such a set. Um, so here's the summary. For each Q in AM, we expect that F is pretty big on UQ. And we know how we, we heuristically found how big UQ is. So if we set Lambda to be that big, then the size of U Lambda intersect BN squared would be bigger than the sum over all the choices of Q in the denominator of UQ intersect BN squared. And if you work that out, that's N to the seventh lambda to the minus six. Okay. Um, so this set U lambda still has a special structure. It's organized into a fairly small number of generalized arithmetic progressions. Okay, so let's summarize the situation for the main question for intermediate lambda. Um, if lambda is intermediate, then the examples where this is sharp have some number theoretic structure. They're exponential sums over integers or maybe over some algebraic integers. And the sets U lambda are organized into a fairly small number of either lattices or generalized arithmetic progressions. So, so I have many questions. Um, actually, let's pause there. Um, uh, so, the, so, okay, so the, so the intermediate lambda, it's very different from big lambda or small lambda. There are only a few known examples and they're very special. Okay, and now I have many questions, which I'm gonna share with you for the rest of the talk. And, and also if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about how this, how this comes up and about why it seems difficult to me. Okay, my first question was, uh, can, can, for that algebraic integer example, is this really true? And, um, and does it work for other number fields? But my big but vague question is, when this thing is sharp, does F have some special structure? Does it in some sense resemble these algebraic integer examples? Or does it have some kind of number theoretic structure when this bound is sharp? Okay, so I wanna develop some actual questions, some precise questions that are related to this vague question. Um, okay, before we do that, let's talk briefly about questions in the literature that people have thought about that this is, has a similar flavor. One thing it, it reminds me of, and prob probably some of you, is Freeman's theorem and additive combinatorics. Freeman's theorem says if we have a set of real numbers and the sum set A plus A is only a little bit bigger than A, then the only way that can happen is that A basically looks like a generalized arithmetic progression. So formally, it's contained in an arithmetic progression with some bound on the density and some bound on the size. Uh, cool. So this is an example of a structure theorem that you know if if something uh, extreme will happens, then um, the object in question has to have a structure that's even a little bit reminiscent. Um, so that's a anyway. So one might wonder if if ideas related to this could be helpful. Another question it reminds me of is the inverse problem for the Samaretti-Trotter theorem. 
So the Samaretti Trotter theorem says if you have a set of points in the plane, the number of k rich lines, that's lines that contain at least k points of p, is bounded by this expression, which is sharp. Um, and um, you can ask, uh, what are all the sharp examples? And again, there's a very short list. So some sharp examples that I know that are in my the book I wrote about incidence geometry and polynomial methods are rectangular grids under some appropriate n1 and n2. This grid could be a sharp example. You could take the dual of an example um, if you interchange points and lines. And you can take projective transformations because they preserve all of the structures. Those are the, all the examples that I knew until recently. And as I was thinking about this, I noticed that there's an algebraic integer example that's similar to um, the one we talked about for decoupling. Um, so if a n is n, n1 plus n2 root 2, where these are integers of a certain size, then if you take the corresponding product set, a n cross a n, um, then it also has the number of k rich lines that matches the upper bound in some ready try. It actually works basically as well as a regular integer grid, um, and the proof is basically the same. I looked a little bit as a, I was curious whether this, I, I haven't seen this example in the literature before, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone had observed it. Um, anyway, the inverse problem for the Samaretti Trotter theorem, unlike the Freeman's theorem, this is a wide open problem. It's a very interesting problem to try to say anything about the structure of sets where, um, where Samaretti Trotter is tight. Um, and the fact that there are these examples that are sort of similar for the two problems makes me a little intrigued whether there might be some relationship between the two problems. Um, although I don't, I don't know what it could be. Okay, those are some related things. Now let's try to make our vague question um, precise. So here's the vague question. If lambda is intermediate between n to the half and n, and u lambda intersect bn squared saturates the bound from decoupling, then does f have some kind of number theory structure? Can we say anything about it? Okay, how can we make it precise? So here's one way. Here's one way. Suppose we replace the parabola with the circle. When we do that, we destroy the examples that I've shown you. And then I actually don't know any examples for the circle where this bound from decoupling is tight. And so a precise question that we can ask is um, just what is the bound for the circle? So here's the question. Suppose S is the upper half circle, cover it with N rectangles of the, of the usual dimensions. And suppose F theta and F are as usual. Um, then the question is how big can U lambda intersect B N squared B? So we, so we know that it's at most that, uh, but how big can it actually be? Um, so if you do uh, wave packet tuning, like in the earlier slides, it gives examples of size n squared over lambda. If lambda equals n, it matches the upper bound. So for lambda equals n, it works just as well for the circle. Hmm. Um, Uh, but if lambda is less than n, then this is much smaller. Okay, so here's the question again in a precise way. What's the biggest possible volume of this? Um, and um, and the, the upper bound, the best upper bound that I know comes from decoupling. The best lower bound that I know um, comes from the wave packet tuning. So let's assume that lambda is significantly bigger than n to the one half. Um, and so there's a huge gap in here. And that's a concrete question that I'd be very curious about. I wanted to say that I think it would be great to look for some more examples. So on the one hand, it's plausible that this upper bound can be improved. And I would be very excited if someone improves that upper bound. Uh, but it also, also, I don't know how to get started. It seems kind of hard. Um, on the other hand, this lower bound, um, it, was very simple. I, I, I think it's very likely there are better examples and better lower bounds here. And I think it would be very instructive to have our hands on um, more examples to improve that lower bound. So I, yeah, I think, I think I encourage people to look for more examples. Okay, that was for the circle. How can we make a precise question for the parabola? Um, 
a long time ago when um, Pfefferman had just worked out the, the uh, counterexample to the ball multiplier problem and saw how some of these harmonic analysis problems were connected to Kakea. He gave a talk at the ICM and he suggested at the end, instead of measuring the size of a set by its volume, maybe we should measure the size by how many long thin rectangles are needed to cover the set. And in that spirit, um, maybe instead of measuring the size of a set by its volume, maybe we should measure the size by how many generalized arithmetic progressions are needed to cover it. So let's make that precise. Um, it's a definition that's reminiscent of Hausdorff content. We let G denote the one neighborhood of a generalized arithmetic progression. And then norm of G is just the volume of G or basic, which is basically the same as the number of elements in the gap. And then for a set X, we can have a, uh, and an alpha between zero and one, we can define its gap Hausdorff content with exponent alpha by looking at all the ways of covering X by gaps. And the cost of a cover is the sum of the size of the gap to the alpha. And then you take the inf, so you take the best cover. Right? So this says, you know, if you want to sort of purchase this set, then you get a good deal on gaps. Uh, you can, can uh, if alpha is two thirds, you can get a gap, you can purchase a gap of size a thousand for only a hundred dollars. Um, whereas if you took a thousand points that were totally random and disorganized and you had to buy them one at a time, that would still cost a thousand. Now a single unit ball is a trivial example of a, of a set G and it has size one. So if X is a union of unit balls, then gap HC alpha of X is at most the volume of X. But if X has a lot of gap structure, then it would be much smaller. So here's a precise question for the parabola. Um, how, how big could the gap Hausdorff content be for u lambda intersect bn squared? This is just a way of making precise the idea that, um, well, or the question, whether all the sharp examples have the kind of gap structure that we saw in the couple of sharp examples we actually know. So in all the examples that I know of, um, so, so we know for sure that this gap Hausdorff content is bounded by the volume, is bounded by n to the seven lambda to the minus six. But in all the examples that I've shown you, the value of this is much smaller, depending a little bit on alpha. Um, okay, so, so the precise question is, how big could this be? And again, I think it would be very, it would be very exciting to improve on n to the seven lambda to the minus six. And it would also be exciting to find some new examples that are where this thing is bigger than in the examples from the talk. Um, now, since this upper bound, so, well, I don't want to say for sure that it's very hard because I don't want to discourage people uh, from doing you know, something interesting. And, and, uh, but anyway, um, since I'm not, let's put it this way, since I don't know how to get started, um, then it can be good to, to make the problem easier somehow. And here's one thing we could do to make it easier. Um, we could make it easier by putting some randomness into the story. So suppose I take a random set of unit balls in Bn squared. Let's say there are V equal to N to the seven lambda to the minus six ran randomly chosen unit balls. And suppose we have our usual setup. Um, can it happen that the norm of F is around lambda on most of X? Like if we took a totally unstructured random set could it happen that we saturate the bound in decoupling? Um, I guess what I put here is, can we prove that that is impossible? Um, so I guess, I guess that that's where my intuition leans, that for a random set, you can't do this. Um, here's a precise question. Um, so, so pick a random set of V unit balls and try to estimate the L1 norm of F on this set. So if V is N squared over Lambda, then we can do wave packet tuning. And that gives examples where the norm of F is around Lambda on most of these points. So FL1 would be Lambda times V, which is N squared. Interestingly, it doesn't really depend on V. Uh, of course, we could also take random F theta. So we could have norm of F could be around N to the half on, on the whole set. That's not hard. Um, and those are the only two constructions I can think of to do for a random set. And so, I'm curious if those, if those two constructions are tight for a random set X. Um, 
Um, okay, so coming back, so if, if coming back to try to try to relate this random question to our original problem, suppose I randomly choose n to the seventh lambda to the minus six unit balls in bn squared, um, can we prove that fl1 of x is much less than lambda times v? Um, and if we can do that, it tells us something about our original problem. Um, so now go back, if, if you can do something like that, which would be cool, so then go back and suppose we have a sharp example for the original problem. U lambda intersect bn squared is around n to the seventh lambda to the minus six. Um, what can we say about the structure of U lambda? If you can prove that U lambda isn't just a random set, then perhaps you can say something about the structure of U lambda. And even if we can't say it's a gap uh, or a few gaps, anything we could say, I think would be cool. So let's pause there, because that was the heart of my talk, these uh, questions that I wanted to, to uh, bring up to everybody. That are harmonic analysis questions, but where it seems like possibly there's some number theoretic structure, which is important to what's going on. Um, so, so our main somewhat vague question, understanding the sharp examples for this thing, it, it comes up in a couple of harmonic analysis or PDE questions that I've wondered about. Um, the mixed norm Strickart's estimates on the circle and the Schrodinger maximal function estimate on the circle. So to give the idea, I'll explain how, how does it come up for the mixed norm Strickart's estimates. So first let's back up and remember what those things are. Um, so suppose we have a solution to the Schrodinger equation on R cross R with initial data U naught of X. Then the Strickard's estimate is a space-time estimate. Um, the L6 norm of the solution in space and time is bounded by the L2 norm of the initial data in space. Um, that's the, uh, I think, original version, but it also has a mixed norm version, which is quite useful and uh, important in, in PDE and nonlinear PDE. So the strongest, the, the, the most, the, the best mixed norm estimate um, in, in these dimensions is that U L4 in time, L infinity in space is bounded by U naught L2, initial data in L2. Uh, so in other words, let me write out what that means. It's um, the integral of u of dot comma t l infinity of x to the fourth dt to the one quarter. Okay, so now what, what happens on the circle? Um, suppose we have a solution to the Schrodinger equation on the circle and it goes for all time, but the, the estimates that make things analogous are, let's, let's look at the time interval zero to one. And it has initial data u naught. And now we need to normalize a little bit the initial data. So suppose that the Fourier transform of the initial data has frequencies of size capital N. Then um, it was proved in the early 90s that the Strickard's estimate almost basically survives. The L6 norm of the solution on the circle up to time one is bounded by N to the epsilon times the L2 norm of the initial data. So this is a new feature on the circle that has to be there. Um, and stopping at time one also has to be there because the L2 norm is conserved. So if you look for very long times uh, on the circle, this, this would have to be infinite. So this is, okay. So that's, an, that's a useful theorem. It, it's, uh, for example, important in understanding the nonlinear Schrodinger equation on the circle. And you can ask about the mixed norm estimate, which is an open problem. So here's the question. If I take the solution L4 and T L infinity and X on the circle, time goes from zero to one. Is that also bounded by n to the epsilon times the L2 norm of the initial data? Okay, so to think about that, it's useful to unpack these mixed norms um, uh, and think about what they mean sort of geometrically. I, I find it helpful when thinking about what this mixed norm means to picture it in terms of these super level sets, u lambda. Okay, so let's say we have our solution and u lambda is the set of points in space time where the solution norm of the solution is bigger than lambda. And let's say that pi sub t is the projection to the time axis. So if we have a mixed norm Strickard's estimate, it's like, like this estimate, it's an integral dt. Um, what does it say about u lambda? 
Well, um, if we look at the set, if we take U lambda and project it to the time axis, those are times where the L infinity norm is at least lambda. So then if we look at that integral, that integral, it's at least lambda to the fourth times the size of the set of times where the L infinity norm is at least lambda. So if this mixed norm strict arts was true, it would imply that the size of pi t of u lambda is at most n to the epsilon lambda to the minus four L2 norm of the initial data to the fourth. And this is almost the same inequality. This is like a weak type version of the mixed norm strict arts inequality. Okay. Um, so, so that, there's our mixed norm strict arts conjecture. And we can look at the key example, basically the same key example from the beginning of the talk. Um, the initial data would be the sum of E of Jx, J goes from one to N. And that means the solution would be the sum of E of Jx plus J squared T. And um, if you plug in this key example into star, there is an equality. But the remarkable thing is that in the key example, U lambda is, um, I didn't say this quite right, it's, is uh, a few rectangular lattices. So let me make a picture here. Uh, so here's S1 and here's time going from zero to one. Um, and I'm gonna try to draw in red U lambda. Um, so U lambda is big near rational times. So zero, a half, um, one third, two thirds. And at those rational times, we see a few tiles. And the spacing of the tiles is a bit different at different times, depending on the denominator. Okay, so this is a picture of U lambda. It has the geometry that we talked about when we were talking about the key example. And we wanna know how big its projection is onto the time axis. So if we take the projection onto the time axis, we see these times here that are near the rational numbers. Okay, and then if you, if you compute, um, this, the size of this projection is tight for this back. But the thing is the projection looks funny. It looks a little bit wasteful because many different rectangles were projected onto the same little interval on the time axis. And so if we were allowed to like move these rectangles around a little bit, then we could arrange that the projection was much bigger. Um, or conversely, in order to prove that the projection is never bigger than this, we would have to prove that this key example is very rigid and that all of the other examples where U lambda has the same size, they all share this peculiar concentration of U lambda into a few times. Um, I couldn't think of any mechanism to prove such a thing. And the most promising thing seemed to me to be that maybe it's true that when U lambda is big, it has to have this gap structure. It has to you know, come from the kind of number theory algebraic integer examples that we've seen. And then maybe for all of those, it's believable that they all have this, this structure. Or on the other hand, maybe there are some, some more examples out there and this is just wrong. You know, this conjecture could be wrong. Uh, Okay, so that's how this problem comes up in, um, in some, some re is related to some more traditional maybe problems in harmonic analysis. Um, and, um, cool. and I think that's actually, that's a good time to, to stop. And um, so thank you for having me and, uh, and I'll be happy to hang out and, and talk a little bit.